find the directional derivative of the function in the direction of u at the point 1, 2. u can be written as the square root of 2 over 2i plus the square root of 2 over 2j in both forms. The magnitude of u turns out to be 1, so it is already a unit vector. Notice that u divided by its magnitude doesn't change a thing, and we need that to start. Next, we need to find the partial derivatives of f with respect to x and the partial derivatives of x with respect to y. Here's the partial with x. Notice it's 2xy because when we find the partial with respect to x, y is held as a constant. And the same argument for f uh, with respect to y, we hold x as a constant and we get this answer, x squared plus 2y. We need to know the values of the partial derivatives at the point 1, 2. That's what's in the blue right here. I've worked it out. This one turns out to be 4, and f with respect to y turns out to be 5. Now the equation for the directional derivative at the point 1, 2 is we put in the f partial with x value times the uh, square root of 2 over 2 from this value right there. And we do the same with the y, which turns out to be 5 times this value right there. Adding 4 square roots of 2 over 2 plus 5 square roots over 2 over 2 is 9 square roots of 2 over 2. And that's the answer. Finding the equation of a tangent plane at a given point. We'll be using this formula. This is the equation, this is our given point. We need to create a function by setting the equation equal to zero. The next step is to find the partials with respect to x, y, and z respectively. I've done that here. Then we need to take the initial point and find the values of the partial derivatives for all three. I've done that here. Now we put the values into the formula that we were given above. And we basically multiply it out, set it equal to zero. Then, as convenience, we go ahead and simplify the answer by dividing everything by 2. That's your answer. Finding local extrema on a given surface. The first step is to find the partials with x, the partials with y, set them both equal to 0, and create a system of equations, and then solve it. The next step is to find partial xx, partial yy, partial xy. Then we want to create this equation right here, where we take the xx times the yy and subtract the xy squared. This value is 3, which is greater than 0. Notice that xx2, which is also greater than 0. So, by the second partial derivative test, z has a local minimum at 4, negative 2. The actual minimum can be calculated here, and it is negative 6. The answer to the question, local minimum is 4, comma, negative 2, comma, negative 6. Finding absolute extrema. Given surface and a restricted domain. Step one is to find the partials with x, the partials with y. Create a system of equations. Notice the 0y. 
solve that system, that's this point, one comma one half, that is a critical point. And you can see one one half is within the domain. So it is a critical point. Next, we want to travel across the lines of this domain. When x equals zero and y is allowed to be y, we get 4y by putting 0 in for x here, 0 in for x here, and of course 4y there. And also, when x is 3 and y is allowed to be y, that's this right here, we put in a 3 for the x and we end up getting 9 uh, minus 8y. Both of these functions are linear, so therefore the highest and lowest points will occur at the endpoints. Now, when x is allowed to be x and y is 0, we will travel along uh, this line right here. That's putting in a 0 for y here, a 0 for y here, leaving x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x, which means x is 0, which is one of the endpoints of our domain. And when x is allowed to be x and y is 2 because of the endpoint of y, we get the equation x squared minus 8x plus 8 by putting 2 in for y here, 2 in for y there. The derivative is 2x minus 8. Setting it equal to 0 means x equals to 4, which is outside of our domain. So we still have all possible values happening either at the endpoints of the domain or at the critical value, which is in here. So we need to check all of those values. Here we have z of the origin, z of 0, 2, z of the critical value, z of 3, 0, and z of 3, 2. And these are the values you get when you plug them into the equation. Noticing that minus 7 is the lowest and positive 9 is the highest. Therefore, the answer, z has an absolute maximum of 9 at the point 3, 0. Z has an absolute minimum of negative 7 at the point 3, comma 2, and that's your answer. Find the volume under a surface over a given region. Here's our surface. There's the region. X goes from minus 1 to 1. Y goes from 0 to 1. To find the volume, we can set up a double integral in two ways. First one with the dx on the inside, notice the limits here, match with those limits, or the dx on the outside, minus 1 to 1, and of course 0 to 1 for y. I've calculated both here, they both come out to be 20 thirds. Both methods are about the same degree of difficulty, so there was no advantage or disadvantage to which way to go first or second in this case. Here is another example of finding the volume of a surface over a given region where this is the surface. The region is defined by some curves here, x equals to the square root of y, x equals to negative y, and of course y equals 1. I've made some changes here to show you how to graph it of course, y equals x squared is this parabola here. But because of this, x can only have positive values. So that's this part of the curve here, or x squared. y equals 1 needs no uh, explanation. And x equals minus y is the same as y equals minus x here. So we're talking about the region inside here. Uh, and looking at this, it seems to me that y will be going from 0 to 1 where x will be going from this curve to that curve. So x is in the interval from minus y, notice it's minus y here, all the way over to the square root of y here. I've used these parts because I'm going to put dx on the inside, so x will go from minus y to the square root of y, just like this says. And then y will go from 0 to 1. That's not so bad. So 0 to 1 dy, and we get this double integral right here. 
First calculate the inside, and you see we have 3x squared y, so as far as x is concerned, y is a constant. So this will be 3yx cubed over 3. The 3's will cancel. It'll just be x cubed y. Then we're going to put in a negative uh, y and the square root of y in for the x so that we get, well, that's going to be 3 halves plus 1 or 5 halves. And then it's going to be, uh, looks like um, minus y cubed plus 1 more y makes y fourth. But because it's minus and we're subtracting, that becomes plus. And then I just did this integral here, 5 halves plus uh, 1 is 7 halves times 2 over 7 plus y to the 5th over 5. Of course, evaluating from 0 to 1 is nice because we can just uh, see the zeros out. So putting a 1 in for y in this one, this leaves the fraction 2 fifths, uh, sorry, 2 sevenths plus 1 fifth right here and it results in 17 over 35. We are going to evaluate a double integral in rectangular coordinates by switching it to polar coordinates. r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. We've known that. Also important here, dy dx or dx dy, it doesn't matter the order, is always equal to r dr d theta. Notice the extra r. Don't forget the extra r. That's a big problem to forget that. You should refer to the handouts to see why that's the case. But in this example, we're just going to say, remember, dy dx in polar coordinates turns into r dr d theta. Then we can make some other changes too. Obviously, we have x squared plus y squared here. That's going to turn into just r squared. And then we can look at the region from 0 to the square root of 4 minus x squared, and that's for y, and x is going to go from 0 to 2. So I've graphed that out here. x is going from 0 to 2. Notice that y equals 4 minus x squared when you square both sides and uh, add x squared back. You get x squared plus y squared is 4. That's a circle of radius 2, but only good in the first quadrant. So we have this graph, and in a polar sense, this is the graph r equals to 2. Very simple. And you can see here that if we have uh, r going in the first one, we're going to have r is going to go from 0 all the way out to 2 in every direction. So 0 to 2. Then we had the x squared plus y squared, which became this r squared. But because of this extra r in here, that's going to become r cubed. That's important. Don't forget that extra r. So r is going from 0 to 2. Theta is this angle here, which is going to go from 0 all the way to pi over 2. And notice d theta is on the outside. It's going from 0 to pi over 2. We have this double integral, which it quickly evaluates to r squared times r or r cubed becomes r to the fourth over 4. Evaluated from 2 to 0 is just 4. That's 16 divided by 4, or 4. Then 4 d theta becomes 4 times theta, and 4 times pi over 2 minus 0 is well, 4 divided by 2 is 2 pi. Not a bad integral. Okay. Here's an example of a triple integral. As you can see, it's defined here. Basically, we're just going to work from the inside out. I have all the stuff here. It's a little complicated. There's some algebra involved in it. I tried to use some color here to help you. Let's see, um, notice the canceling of the twos in line three. Just some good bookkeeping all the way to the end here. At the very end, I have an integration by parts, and I used the table method for that. You can see there's uh, some room for error in the calculation for sure, but as you just stick to your guns there, you yeah, eventually get to the end. So we just work from the inside, doing each integral separately all the way out, paying attention to the limits and to the respect to variables that we're differentiating with. And of course, as always, trying to keep our algebra straight. There's a couple of zeros in there. One zero in particular at the end here. This one down here near the last line. Notice that you have a 
the integration there where you're putting a zero in for e to the x. e to the zero is actually one, so you're subtracting a negative six, so you actually get that plus six. That plus six on the end might mess with some people. Don't forget that e to the zero is one. That last term right there does not have an x to cancel out with, so you do get a minus minus six or a plus six, which will get you to the right answer. Okay, there you go. Okay, we're going to find the volume uh, underneath this surface right here, represented by this picture, um, above the xy plane and below this uh, surface here, which is this. So first thing we want to do is we want to find the x-intercept, the y-intercept, and the z-intercept. So let the other variables equal zero and solve for the perspective intercepts, and you get the fact that the, it's, uh, six is the y-intercept, three is the x-intercept, uh, and two is the z-intercept. By letting x and y be zero, x and y are zero, three z equals six, z must be two, and so on for that one. We also want to solve this equation for z so that we have an equation for the surface. z is equal to two minus two-thirds x uh, minus one-third y after you solve that for z. Also, this red line is important here. This is the red line uh, where you get uh, a y-intercept of six and x-intercept of three. So you know the y-intercept is 6, that's going to be here, and the y equals mx plus b. And then from this point, you go down 6 and over 3. So that's minus 6 over 3, otherwise known as minus 2. You can also use these two points in the point-slope equation and just get the equation in the line because we're going to use that right here. I did rewrite it as 6 minus 2x here um, because I don't like leading negatives, but no big deal. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go from the uh, y is going to go from 0 up to this red line starting from zero, going to the red line. So y is gonna go from zero to the red line. And then x is gonna go from zero to three for that surface right there. So we get this double integral from zero to three for the x, zero to six minus two x for the y, and here's the surface that we found for z. We go ahead and calculate out this integral. It's uh, not too bad, there's some algebra going on in here, be careful of it. Some reduction stuff happens, but it's still, uh, just keep, Keep your good bookkeeping and you'll end it with six at the end and that is the answer. I think the hardest part of this problem is looking at this surface. Maybe you should look at either maple to get that picture uh, drawn a little better or try to draw it yourself. I'm just not really good with 3D pictures, but there you go. Okay, we're going to find the gradient of this function, x cubed y, at the point 2, 1. Then we're going to find the directional derivative from the point 2, 1 towards 3, 5 um, using the gradient. First thing we do for the gradient, that's this symbol here, is we find the partial of x and the partial of y. Did that here. Partial of x is 3x squared y. Partial of y is x cubed. And then we install the point 2, 1 to get 12. And for the partial with y, we get 8. And we have the vector 12, 8. And that is the gradient of the function at 2, 1, the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem says from the direction 2, 1 to 3, 5. So I need to create that uh, vector 3 minus 2 comma 5 minus 1 becomes a vector 1 over 4, uh, 1 comma 4. Don't forget we need to unitize it, normalize it. So the uh, magnitude is 1 squared plus 4 squared or 17, square root of 17. So we have the square root of 17 in the denominator times 1, comma 4 for this vector direction. And all we have to do is dot this with the gradient. So we take the gradient and dot it with this unit vector. So that becomes this dotted with this. Uh, 1 times 12 is uh, 12. 4 times 8 is 32. We have the 1 over the square root of 17 here. Uh, 32 and 12 is 44 over the square root of 17. And that's your answer. Okay, we're going to find the volume under this surface and above the xy plane. Uh, the xy plane would be where z is equal to zero. So if you do that, set z equal to zero, you can get this equation, which works it down to x squared plus y squared equals four. That's a circle with radius two on the xy plane, which I've drawn here. That's what it looks like on the xy plane. And then when x and y equals 0, z is 12, so it comes up to 12. And we have a nice paraboloid that opens downward all the way to the xy axis. And we want to go ahead and calculate the volume under there. What I'm going to do is calculate the volume in the first uh, octant, 
if you will, the first quadrant of the XY plane or the uh, first octant of the uh, three-dimensional uh, space. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and solve this equation, x squared plus y squared equals 4 for y. So we know that y will go from 0 to that equation. So we have 0 to that equation. x will go from 0 to 2, and the surface will go inside. So we have dy going from 0 to 4 minus x squared under the square root. And we have dx going from 0 to 2 of the surface. That's the surface we were given. And because we use symmetry, I'll just multiply this times 4 because it'll be 1, 2, 3, 4 of those volumes, which are all symmetrical. I like to take advantage of the zeros here. And then I need to calculate this uh, double integral right here. And I'll do that in just a second. Okay, we're starting the integral that we were talking about. So I went in here and uh, did it with respect to y first. Plugged in the limits, got this equation, expression, excuse me. Then I did some simplifying. I actually factored out a 4 minus x squared to the 1 half from every one of these things. That left me with a 1 right here, and therefore I could actually work this down to something convenient, 8 minus 2x squared. When you pull a 2 out of there, you can have this 2 come all the way out, make this 8, and combine these two to get this right here. And this is where I am. Now this one will have to be done using some method I think I'm going to use, trig substitution. Okay, so we set up our triangle like this, uh, however you want to do it, that's how I want to do it. And then I start solving for the different pieces I need. Uh, I have that the sine of theta is x over 2, that works out good for x here to give me dx, 2 cosine theta d theta. The cosine of theta is this over 2, so we can multiply both sides here to get to 2. And if I cube both sides, I get 8 cosine of theta equals to uh, this, to the 3 halves, which I have here. So now I have all my pieces. I have my expression, 8 cosine uh, cubed of theta, and my d theta, 2 cosine of theta, d thetas. That makes uh, 16 times 8, or 128. Changing my x limits from 0, I put in 0 here. The sign of uh, 0 is 0. That's good. And then to get to 2, if I put in a 2 here, the sign of theta equals 1. Theta is pi over 2. That was not too bad. And, of course, these two cosine to the first power of the third make cosine to the fourth. Which means I'll use the uh, power reduction formulas for a trig. Work that out down here. A little bit of algebra here, a little bit of trig, works its way down and becomes 24 pi. Okay. 